What's up, everyone? Welcome to a, another episode. We're going to do another exciting interview today. With me is Kelsey McGuire. Kelsey is currently the CGO at Shardium, previously CMO at CoinFund, head of experiential marketing at Consensus. A couple cool uh, roles there for sure. Another New York native, which is uh, good to see. I was just listening to a couple of podcasts. I, I love this space because everyone is so like such media creators, I feel like in the crypto space more than most industries. So you can kind of hear, um, you know, a lot of the, the questions I feel like founders deal with of like, you know, are these issues my issues is the whole industry, like stuff like that. You can, I think, battle test a little bit or, or see a little bit better based on like the content people put out. But across the board, it seems like a lot of people feel like the advertising in the crypto space industry is coming back a bit and we're feeling the same. So it's a, it's a good week over here. I walk through a very, very high level of like your backgrounds, but give me the long form version. Like what, what have you been up to the past, let's say five, 10 years? And then what got you into Web3? I'm curious about as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in marketing, growth, branding, strategic partnerships, that whole big kind of umbrella of different activities for a pretty long time now. I started in the fashion and beauty industry a long time ago, but was really interested in the idea of pivoting over and, and working in tech. I initially sort of explored some opportunities with consulting and took some small clients on in the startup space. But around 2017, I'd say some of my friends that were in banking here in New York City started really getting a little concerned about something called blockchain and, and Web3. So had a few conversations with them and I figured if, if it's something that they're worried about, it's probably something worth digging into and learning a little bit more about. So I gave myself a little bit of a crash course at that time with any of the resources that were out there and ended up going through the interview process at Consensus and started out focused on community strategy for Consensus, you know, the big Ethereum focused organization. So it was kind of like that initial education and community layer. And then also had the great privilege of working with some projects called Spokes, which were basically in like in a way their portfolio companies. And that was everyone from Gitcoin to MetaMask. And so you get a lot of great exposure across the ecosystem. I ended up then working with L1 name called Cello. Now they're in L2, I believe, on some of the strategic partnership marketing over there before jumping over to CoinFund to work as the CMO, which was a really cool experience. I hadn't been on the VC side before, and I was really looking at overall CoinFund and their positioning, but a really awesome part of that was working with a lot of our different portfolio company founders. I'm, I'm still in touch with some of them today. We can bounce ideas and have some of those types of conversations. After that, I ended up, like you mentioned, over here at Shardium. So it was, it's been a great journey. I'm the CGO now, and that's another sort of, I would say, kind of big umbrella role that encompasses, you know, marketing, communications, branding, um, sort of some of those regional strategies I'm focused on parts of the US right now. And, you know, I get to, I have the privilege of sort of visiting some of these different conferences and making these different connections and understanding really what the community needs and what they're interested in and how to really start providing that for them. Awesome. At Shardium, is there also a CMO or is that kind of like the Shardium's version of it is CGO? Yeah, it's Shardium's version of the CMO, I would say. And it's always interesting, and I would love to hear your thinking on this too. And when, when you consider like a CGO role versus a CMO role, I found that also having the CGO title can sometimes encompass a little bit more of the sort of broad strategic level work that I think CMOs do anyway. Um, and it can help facilitate and open some doors when it comes to different types of connections and speaking opportunities in a way the CMO title didn't. Because I find that some, you know, reporters or conferences, they don't want to hear from what they consider to be a marketing person, which is an unfortunate corner to just be put in and sort of ignored where growth and strategy somehow get their attention a little bit more when honestly, a lot of it is the same work. Have you found that to be the case at all? Or have you seen a big difference in those roles in these conversations? I find it largely is like just a semantics thing, at least in the experience that I've seen. But I, I honestly do like the title CGO better. I feel like it's a better fit than CMO, at, at least as far as the responsibilities that that role tends to have. Like marketing versus growth. Marketing is kind of like a component of growth, but it's not the whole picture. And typically what companies are relying on the, the CMO or, or CGO for is, is growth, whether it's like marketing related, whether it's biz dev, 
which can arguably be you know not considered a, a marketing task with our employees, for example. I, rather than assign tasks, I'd rather assign kind of goals. And I feel like growth is more aligned than than marketing is with you know what's trying to be accomplished. But yeah, I feel like it's it's one of those things that the internal culture of the company tends to dictate, but they, they tend to be relatively similar. I find that to be the case too. And I, I'm definitely on the same page with you when it comes to sort of looking at goals over tasks as well as a way to really sort of manage a team and, and keep people excited and engaged. So I think it's a great way to look at things. Yeah, definitely. I, explain Shardium. Like I, I, you know, obviously it's a, it's a blockchain company, meaning it's going to be over the head of most like general population people. But what's kind of the explain like I5, I'm five version? Yeah, absolutely. So for folks that aren't really familiar with Web3 or blockchain, so Shardium, this is kind of the complicated side, is a highly scalable EVM-based layer one blockchain. And it's like, okay, what does that actually mean? A layer one blockchain, I always like to think of it as this is the foundation. Like if you're thinking about building a house, you need to pour the right type of foundation and different foundations can have different types of qualities. So if you're five and you're thinking about building a house or you want to build a big Lego tower or something like that, you have to have the right sort of mat or maybe it's one of those ridged pieces to start building on um, and what we like to think of it is we provide that kind of mat or ridge piece so no matter what creative idea you have you can build it on shardium so say you want to build a big tower with a moat and walls around it out of legos or blocks or whatever system you have you'd be able to do that quickly where and securely and and really like without limits where perhaps some building materials and foundations wouldn't quite be able to come together in the same way, or it might fall down, or you might have to compromise on not building the moat or building the wall and just building the tower, or maybe you just build the wall and the moat and you can't build the tower at all. So we really want to address all three of those different areas. And, and that's called the trilemma, which is scalability, security, and decentralization. So we want all of those components to be able to come together without limits for the folks that are building, as opposed to just having to choose one or two. Very cool. What are some of the more like exciting, I guess, developments in the Shardium community of the past year? Yeah, it's been a really, really, really big year for us. Um, we've had this amazing project called Backpacking India. It's part of our proof of community initiative. So proof of community are these amazing little meetups that the team puts on all around the world. We've had over 225 proof of community events in over 85 cities. And these are get togethers that can span from VC focus to technical and builder focus to just sort of community get togethers. Let's have a drink and chat and support each other that are focused on the Shardium ecosystem. So that's a really massive development for us. We are also able to close a strategic round of 5.4 million in this past year that will help kind of spur these growth efforts that we have. And we're heading towards mainnet, which is a massive thing for us. So we're doing all those exciting kind of prep work on the growth and marketing side. And we're looking forward to hopefully hitting that milestone early in the new year. Very cool. And what I guess uh, got you into Chartium as a member? So. You know, I had a, there were some really interesting projects that I was working with and some of the portfolio companies with CoinFund and, and the team had reached out to me from Shardium a couple of times and I ended up digging into the project a little bit more. And for me, it was really seeing that intense focus on community, like that incredible number of people in the Discord community that are active. Like I think I mentioned it's 500,000, 600,000 folks in there the different meetups, the proof of community events that I mentioned earlier, that it really felt like this was a project that was getting the kind of like exciting growth and traction that you want to see as someone in our, our line of work, along with the right types of values. And by that, I mean a very community oriented approach instead of just say, like, I've seen some projects that are focused more on something that feels much more transactional, like it's just a paid ad strategy, which I certainly don't recommend for these types of projects. So. It got me really interested. And once I started meeting the different team members, I was like, this is something really special. So I decided to take the plunge. I think it's been about five or six months now. Nice. Congrats. Um, Thank you. You definitely, you definitely, based on your resume, have a lot of experience, More definitely you know, way more than most in the marketing for like blockchains space. 
how do you feel like blockchain specific marketing specific to blockchains differs from both like the web three space as well as just kind of like more traditional industries like what what is kind of unique to blockchain marketing and what do you prioritize so i think the community element is fairly unique and to the point where almost community above a lot of other types of what you could consider to be marketing activities I think it, it's something where I've seen more in the traditional space and even kind of just broader tech space that folks will sort of hone in on, like I mentioned earlier, some of the paid advertisements, you know, these sort of very traditional feeling activations, some of those more corporate approaches to things that, again, feel much more transactional. And, and I see in Web3, it really does have to feel much more community oriented, organic, and you're really looking for how these different community members want to see themselves and really creating something that's a part of someone's identity and really focusing in on how you can kind of tap into that and actually serve a purpose through this like strong educational and community oriented foundation. Um, I think another difference is really that intense focus on education. You really can't just kind of rest on your laurels and assume people know what you're doing, know what you're talking about, or will automatically trust any part of what you have going on. You really have to assume that you're starting from almost square one with a lot of different people um, and audience segments and making sure that they actually understand that you have a clear value prop for them. So those are some of the kind of main differences that I'd say that I've seen when I compare my experience outside of Web3 with what I've been doing for the past five or six years now. Cool. So a little bit, I guess, a little uh, more difficult question, but I, I want to list a couple different like just marketing strategies and, and hear how you would prioritize them for a company like Shardium or any blockchain company for that matter. But community, um, branding, SEO, paid advertising, content marketing, how would you prioritize those? So I think that if I had to start at the beginning, you're probably not surprised to hear community. I think a big part of community and building community are those in-person events. Like I mentioned, our proof of community initiative, that has been a huge, huge thing for us when we look at what's impacting our growth and what's really serving those communities. It is those in-person events. So those really work together very closely for us. I'd say branding may be coming in at number three, but again, it's like all of those feel like when you're doing them correctly, it feels like this seamless sort of holistic push because all of these activities are so beautifully intertwined into this one sort of moment and sentiment building exercise for say Shardium or whatever project you're working on. Um, I think content marketing may be coming in right after that. It's sort of a supporting piece when it comes to those branding community, you know, real life in person events. Um, but, you know, I, I've seen that sometimes fail to reach people in the same way that those other pieces, when done correctly, really, truly can. Um, SEO is important. I would say that comes in right under that because I think that how I've seen people engage with SEO, like I said, absolutely important um, in terms of day to day uh, what I, we would spend our time on when we're, say, growing in a new region as a new project. SEO tends to rank slightly lower um, just because we're not we want to be, you know, of course, search optimized and all of those important pieces. But a lot of times we're reaching people before they would really just look for us, if that makes sense. I think down the line, as you grow as a project, that becomes increasingly important, though. So part of this really does depend on where you are in your sort of growth trajectory. Slightly more mature projects should be really much more focused on SEO than some of these early, okay, we're just building out our community. The really the only way they're probably going to hear about us is through these one-on-one -on -one interactions just beginning um, versus down the line where you're like, oh, I want these larger institutional partnerships, for example, or I want to make sure that when someone searches for it, like these specific Web3 keywords or specific things around scalability or, or whatever your focus is that you want to come up. But there is a certain point where you should flip over more of your efforts to SEO. And then probably unsurprisingly, given what I've been saying is paid advertising comes in last for me. I see a lot of different you know, service providers looking to you know, charge projects for paid advertising services and encouraging people to you know, throw a lot of money at paid advertising. And 
I just don't see it working in the way that they want to, especially given where we are with the industry as you know, Web3 marketing people. The times where I've seen it work okay were in the past, and it was a highly targeted regional push directly connected to an event that was happening that week. For example, if there's like an event invitation plus an educational material kind of bumped together and you're paying to make sure that people that are in that specific area or attending that specific conference are seeing it, then you can maybe get a little traction there. But overall, it's something I tend to stay away from. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah, I would assume pretty similar rankings as well, especially with the SEO piece. I imagine the people that are like building on, on a, a blockchain like Shardium have interacted with a blockchain that they want to build on before they're just typing in like what blockchain I should build on. I imagine that's not how the process goes. That ranking there of, of priorities, is that how you'd say your time has been spent and your resources have been spent focused at Shardium? I would say yes, it is roughly in line with that. Um, we did invest and we were focused on SEO as well, just given where we are at this point. But overall, it does reflect that because of our community focus, the proof of community events that we have going on. I also consider we have a great newsletter and that kind of feeds into, it's also content, but that community building initiative that we have because the newsletter will also point to real life events, opportunities to connect with other people. Um, and that's been a really great tool for us and a worthwhile way to spend time. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. You, you know, I asked you obviously to prioritize all the different things, but they, they blend together really well. Like content marketing, like a newsletter, for example, is going to help with the community piece and get people aware of in real life events. Like it, it really is difficult to do one without the other. Um, so I kind of apologize for my somewhat ridiculous question now. <laughs> um, it's good to be able to pick out the pieces, but I feel like if you're doing them right, they should feel like they're blending together seamlessly, at least yeah. from the outside. Yeah. It's it's so difficult nowadays, especially in the Web3 space, to to look at any kind of marketing campaign or, or project and, and, and not look at it as a combination of strategies rather than just one. That's what I found, at least. So like KPIs. What are the KPIs that you're tracking and the team are tracking? So something I always think is really interesting and in, in KPIs that we also look like look at are the website visits um, and as much data as we can get there broken down by region um, and the percentage increase month over month. So that gives us a really great view into which regional strategies, of course, are performing, which messages are working best for which community groups that we're, we're connecting with. Um, and so on. So that's really a great one for us. Um, not specifically a KPI, but I always think it's interesting when you can see which parts of the website people are interacting with the most. I've seen that in past projects that I've worked with, and it can really give you some insight onto where people are getting really, really frustrated with how you're presenting your content or really what's missing and what people are looking for. Um, so it gives you some ways to start addressing that. Um, also look at newsletter signups. I think that this is a really important one. And when you do newsletters right, it's something that's exciting for people to see and you wanna see that you know growth month over month. Um, it shouldn't be something that people feel like they're bombarded with. Like I know that you probably are also this way. I have subscribed to a lot of newsletters and then every single time they arrive, I delete them. Yeah. So of course we wanna make it through to people and make sure that we're providing enough value, enough of that kind of community connection, enough relevant ecosystem news um, that is Shardium related and of course beyond um, so that people do open and that, you know, someone like even, you know, you and I would want to open it as well. So that's a really great one because it kind of can gauge the health of that email list of people that were open enough to sign up for it, but maybe now are feeling a little less interested. And that gives you a lot of kind of data around how you can address it, including like which segments in the newsletter people are clicking on. Is it just like a little, maybe a contest? Is it an event invitation? Is it an article that you're linking to? Any of those types of pieces can give you a lot of insight into what people are thinking about and what people care about. Yeah, I feel a lot of the same way with the newsletter piece, whereas if I'm really you know, excited by a company or something, I'll join the newsletter and then almost immediately as soon as I get it, I'm like, you know what, this really isn't the medium that I want to be contacted like with this. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. I think that's why I, I think especially our industry would prefer to be like marketed to via something like Twitter or X, I guess we have to call it now.
A lot of the KPIs you mentioned are, are, are on the website. Are you using, you know, just Google Analytics? Do you use something more, a little more like, I guess, enterprise level or, or do you like the kind of tried and true basics of Google Analytics? Yeah, I'd say tried and true basics for now. We've been able to get all of the sort of information that we need from that, as well as from really having that close connection with the overall community, which is really what helps us shape the, the website, like I said, the newsletter, the contents, and just really how we're adding value whenever we can. What do you think of the new Google Analytics, the GA4, which they migrated to like six months ago? You know, like we have been fine overall with it. You know, I, I don't have like a super strong, I'm just kind of excited that it's available and that we're able to use it and engage with it, but don't have a really strong opinion either way. What about you? Is it something that's been causing you some grief over there? Yeah, a little bit. I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to essentially build like, they're trying to essentially integrate like Google Analytics and Looker Studio, which is kind of like, for anyone's not aware, like the reporting ability, like you can build like graphs and charts and all kinds of stuff like that and just kind of customize what your data looks like. But in the process, they basically scrapped anything helpful on like the real time analytics side. Um, and now data is so delayed. It used to be like you had data within like an hour, it would show up in your you know non real time reports. And it's like 12 hours now. Um, so it's been a little frustrating. <laughs> it's a work in progress, maybe. It's the kind of thing that like, I'll just be like, angry and grumpy about while I'm using it sometimes. And I'll, I'll mention it to my fiance. And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, it's such a like, no one cares about that. Um, as a marketer, I guess I take it too seriously. Um, that's a whole other She story. provides a healthy perspective. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't understand the universal analytics versus GA4 debate. Um, <laughs> you, you've had a lot of success on Discord. I think your, 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 your membership on Discord is just under, I think half a million. I think 450,000 was what I saw. Is that right? Yeah. We've actually grown past that now. So it's been very, very exciting. I think we're over 500 K now. Uh, what do you think was, you know, played a role in that? That's obviously uh, you, you've got to be one of the larger communities on, on Discord at that point. We are, and it's due to the amazing work by the team. Like I mentioned, I think I, I joined Shardium around five or six months ago and the numbers were already extraordinary. So they have been really just boots on the ground organizing those proof of community meetups that I mentioned and really getting people excited about Shardium, which is no strong or small feat, especially pre mainnet. You know, these, they've been able to, and now all of us together, educate, create that level of sort of enthusiasm and excitement. And even more importantly, that level of camaraderie that really brings people over and keeps them engaged in the Discord community. It's really something special and it's something I've not seen really very much with other teams that, you know, I've seen and, and worked with overall in the past. So it is that just like day-to-day -day engagement and the constant pushing for that, those in-person connections has really facilitated a lot of that. At your role, I imagine you're not really interacting on a daily basis with a community, especially a community of that size probably is, is quite a, an undertaking. What does that team look like? How do you, like, I'm, I'm curious, I, I don't think I've ever managed a team of half a million Discord members. It sounds like a huge undertaking. What's kind of the process there? Absolutely. We have a number of folks that are based in the key regions that where the community meetups are happening. Right now, there's a few different cities in India. So we have a team that both manages sort of the Discord online community and then the key part of that, those proof of community events. And that's a team of around four people, I would say, that are spending a lot of their time. But overall, like we said, everything's woven together really well if, it, if we're doing it right. But we have around you know seven plus people that are focused on all of those different aspects of marketing, of which community is a really, really important part. And we also really focus in, there's a couple folks who are constantly connecting with outside organizations, you know, potential angel investors, and they've also been excited to spin up their own proof of community meetup. So that means that it's not always someone from our team from Shardium that's doing this, it can happen organically, it can happen with excited partners that we have from the ecosystem team and the business development team, which again, are a number of other individuals that we have. So it really is this like, really amazing group 
effort that feels very holistic towards pushing these proof of community events and then the growth from there. And we're actually having our first proof of community event here in New York City next week on Thursday. So excited to kick them off over here as well with with a colleague that we brought on recently who will be managing that on the ground here too. Yeah, that's another interesting point about like Web3 marketing, which is probably different from other industries, which is that you get a level of brand advocacy from the community that is really not seen in other industries. Like we see all the time, once a, a Discord community or a Telegram community gets to a certain size, you get a whole lot of people that just want to help moderate for free because they care about the ecosystem, which is like, I don't know, I, I don't imagine like most like SaaS businesses or anything like that get that kind of like free brand participation. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's something, I agree. I mean, it's something really special about Web3 that if you're focusing on the community and really seeking to provide value and give them what they need, it's really returned tenfold, I would say, because people do get really excited about this type of community and the technology behind it in a way that I just don't necessarily see in other industries. To change gears just a little bit, obviously the market that we're seeing now is a little unique. It's almost like a sideways market that I would say is somewhat trending up at the moment, at least from like a you know, behind the scenes industry activity thing. How have your marketing plans changed over? I know you, have, you've only, you haven't been in Chartium for a full year, but just your mentality towards marketing in, in this industry, how do you think it's changed over the past, say, year and a half since you know, the height of things in late 21 to now, which is you know, almost late 23? You know, I think because at this point, I feel like I've been on this roller coaster and lots of ups and downs and sideways um, moments for quite a while now that I generally keep roughly the same mentality. And that is that intense focus on community and not, you know, wasting money. I see projects that spend to extraordinary degrees when the market's up. And all of a sudden, when then there's a dip, they have to lay off their whole team or there's irresponsible hiring and then there's mass layoffs. And I'm not saying that that's what's happening across the board, but I think if you keep roughly the same mindset and the same sort of priorities throughout all the marketing can, or the market conditions, you'll be in a much better place. And by that, I mean that focus we talked about on community, the focus on building out the brand and being thoughtful about your budget. Um, I think something to be mindful of when the market is booming and everyone's super excited, it's going to be a lot more noisy. So you do need to tailor your efforts accordingly and understand the types of community members that might be flooding in that might not be there for the long haul, um, depending on the market conditions. But I think that you can be pretty steadfast in how you're communicating and moving forward to really help yourself weather some of those ups and downs. You mentioned you know, obviously the concern that every marketer has, which is wasting budget. If you had no limitations on budget and you were going to sh grow Shardium as, as big and fast as possible, how would you spend your money? I think that I would roll out even more of these, like I mentioned, the proof of community, um, throw even more. They don't need, I would say, more budget. It's going great. But just adding even more, like, making them extra special there uh, would be really cool and exciting. And, you know, providing those extra, you know, educational materials, the amazing swag, all of that, I think is really, really cool. I would also really start building out a little bit more of a presence down the line at some of these larger Web3 conferences and events and hosting like educational community moments there. And those add up. That's so expensive to do. And you have to be really careful about where you are and when you want to start doing something like that. But that would be something that I'd be really excited to do. And also, I do love a lot of them are not done in a way that I would necessarily advocate for. But I'm a big fan of grants programs. And I think when they're done properly, allocating budget for something like that, pairing it with these bigger community pushes that I mentioned, these extra special sort of meetups for those community evangelists and all of those different pieces fitting together can be amazing. Um, another thing that I've seen budget used on, again, if you're just kind of like, let's, it's limitless, um, are really beautifully designed and executed educational programs. And that's something you can bootstrap and, and really do well with. So don't get me wrong, but if you have limitless budget, be able to design something that is just top of the line when it comes to user experience and 
the overall like ability to support um, people who are onboarding, bringing on those extra colleagues that can answer any questions, which is really just not something you can do um, unless you have limitless budgets. It's not the best way to to spend money when you're on a budget. You don't want to become just a help desk when you have limited resources. But if you do have limit limitless resources, then you can really provide that sort of full experience that would be really exciting and really help people connect in. Um, so those are some of the, the different pieces. There's so many exciting things and also bringing the team together more, even mm -hmm. though that looks like an internal focused view on things. I think that having the, that face to face time can foster much more seamless collaboration internally, which in turn really helps the overall you know, organization grow exponentially, which helps them grow their communities exponentially. So no Super Bowl ads or buying a the naming rights of a sports arena, none of the Coinbase FTX links. Yeah. <laughs> Probably would not as interesting and flashy as it would be and as exciting as it would be for some of the team. Maybe we have our own box. I would probably go the, the route of the big educational efforts and uh, the proof of community meetups and face to face time, although that would be kind of exciting. <laughs> Yeah, Super Bowl ads obviously are crazy expensive. I don't remember the exact number, but you know, to the tune of a couple million dollars per segment. But the like the what was it? The Digidigaku, the, the NFT project that they bought a Super Bowl ad this year. The amount of earned media generated for that, outside of just obviously the the impressions they're getting from the ad, was was crazy. And honestly, with unlimited budget, it's not probably a bad ROI kind of event, in my opinion. Yeah, I would be really interested to see because I can see with say like a, remember the Coinbase ones, NFT projects when it's in L1 where you're like, hello, builders come, you know, work with us or potential partners. I'd be interested to hear about how many folks who are watching the Super Bowl are primed and like, hey, this is where I want to hear about something that I can build on versus something that I could either sign up for right away, like Coinbase or mint something really quickly. But I could see where it could be potentially impactful if you get the right ecosystem partners in there with you, as long as it feels like you can do something and accomplish something right there that builds a longer term relationship for builders or, you know, partners as an L1, then potentially the ROI would be there. Yeah, I would bet on like a conversion rate standpoint, it'd be awful because like how many people watching the Super Bowl are actually building, you know, capable of building in the blockchain space It's probably a very small percentage. But I would bet also it'd be pretty helpful just for like just the brand's trust and people feeling like, oh, this, you know, the, the starting communities are really growing. They went and they bought a Super Bowl ad like that's a, probably a really exciting ecosystem to be part of. That's I feel like what most people in the Web3 space are going after other than like Coinbase, who obviously has like basically a global target market. All right, just a couple more questions and I'm going to let you go, but biggest challenges you feel Web3 marketers are currently facing? Yeah, I think that probably one of the biggest challenges is almost us standing in our own way. And by that, I mean, we often and everyone, you know, I certainly have been guilty of this in the past too, is we get sort of stuck in our own little echo chambers and sometimes we don't realize it. And so really the biggest challenge is getting out of our own way and looking past ourselves and refocusing on our audience segments and understanding how we can reach them where they are and really how we can reframe all of our messages through the lens of how we serve them. And it's a mistake and something I see a lot of, and we can get into a lot of, you know, it's hard being a web three marketer because you have to build the trust and there's this like big education gap and all of these different pieces that yes, makes our jobs very, very challenging. But I do think that a little bit of, of self reflection when it comes to our roles and how we we look beyond our own little bubbles really is probably the best way forward. Marketing like web three products specifically is 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 so unique from other industries. Like I'm curious where you, someone who's been doing it a long time, goes to like educate themselves on on what's working and what's not working. Like what, what are your favorite, I guess, web three marketing resources, educational resources, if there are any. You know, I think probably the best way to educate yourself, understand what's working and not working is really when you can. And I know it can be prohibitive from like a resource standpoint, costs and whatnot are those larger conferences and smaller meetups around wherever you're based and being able to travel sometimes for those as well. Because I really haven't seen anything that quite hits that level when it comes to sudden sort of those 
aha moments or, oh, wow, I saw this sort of way of communicating and that's definitely not working and that's alienating people or, oh, wow, this community is doing something really, really special and it is working and you can tell by the buzz and the excitement. And so you can see I'm a big fan of like when you can be somewhere in person um, for those types of events that, yeah, if you can make it out, if your job's sending you there, if you're doing a project there, that's when you'll get the best feedback around what's working and what's not. And a lot of times you can build in some almost like incentivized conversation surveys, like information gathering around your audience segments there with fellow marketers that can really, really help with your kind of broaden your understanding of really the ecosystem. So you can sort of look beyond yourself and just your same activities that you might be repeating again and again to varying degrees of, of success. Cool. So I'm going to let you go, but before I do, um, where are the best places for listeners to follow you and follow your, your journey? Absolutely. So please check us out on shardium.org, the website. From there, there's going to be lots of resources, a newsletter. Again, I promise we won't bombard you. Lots of event invitations and all of that good stuff. And then we're on Twitter at Shardium. So if you could check us out there, that would also be a great way to stay up to date with everything. Awesome. Well, Kelsey, thank you for joining me. Uh, I enjoyed our chat a bunch. Yeah, thanks so much, Ty.